Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, first of all, uh, I will introduce Spencer. It's a pleasure for me to, to uh, have you here, really. <laughs> because I admire Glenn Doman and uh, well, I never expected to uh, have a webinar with uh, his grandson. Um, uh, Spencer is uh, the Chief Innovation Officer and the, the Director of uh, Cognitive uh, Development um, Doman International. Uh, he creates um, and innovates new programs for child development. Um, he teaches parents around the world about intellectual, cognitive and speech development and is in charge of all programs and training uh, in this department. But I guess you can ask him any question <laughs> you have. <laughs> yeah, like I mentioned, he's uh, Glenn Doman's grandson. And I uh, guess probably every one of you um, knows me but uh, for those who will watch it later I will introduce myself. I'm Agnieszka Basta uh, and I'm the author of the blog Teach Your Baby PL uh, where I share my experience with, uh, uh, my, uh, with what I do um, with my daughter Doman Method and um, bilingualism or rather multilingualism now because <laughs> we are going crazy with languages. Um, okay, so um, uh, Spencer, maybe we will do it the same uh, way as with Jordan. Uh, maybe one question from the chat and one question from the list that I have that I sent you. But you Perfect. That's <laughs> okay, uh, so maybe uh, you can start uh, with that with the chat. We already have one. Okay. Well, let me just start with a question from the, the list of questions that I received before the webinar. Okay. So, uh, and I'll try to take the questions in order of, you know, what I think will be most applicable to parents out there because I want to, uh, you know, make sure that I cover the biggest questions. So, uh, the, the first question that I'll answer, there's a question here. What is your attitude towards screen time with children up to the age of two? Is limited time okay? Uh, so generally, I'll give you my kind of general philosophy towards screens, uh, and that is to, to try to avoid screen time as much as possible for children under two or three years of age. Uh, now, that being said, um, I don't think that screens by themselves are dangerous or, or bad for kids. I mean, all of us grew up uh, having some kinds of screens in our home, usually televisions, and some of us, depending on our age, uh, computers. And obviously, we've entered a new age now where uh, children can now hold screens in their hands uh, using cell phones, uh, you know, mobile phones, uh, and tablet devices. And I'm actually especially concerned about phones and tablets being in the hands of children for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, it's just easily accessible for children and it's easy for them to spend hours and hours a day uh, interacting with these devices. And it seems that, you know, a lot of these devices, especially because they have games on them, uh, children can spend hours and hours doing it. And now the, you know, research is now coming in showing that children who are spending several hours a day on uh, devices are more likely to have uh, developmental delays. And the researchers that did the research, they said, well, maybe at first they thought, well, children who are spending a lot of time on screens, they, they're more likely to have developmental delays. Maybe children with developmental problems are more likely to spend time on screens. But when they looked deeper into the research, they found that no, uh, it's not that children with special needs or developmental problems are more likely to, to watch, you know, spend time on screens. It's that children spending more time on screens are, you know, more likely to have developmental delay. So look, uh, it's impossible for me to say for every child what is safe and what isn't, but I would definitely, you know, avoid uh, long amounts of screen time. I usually tell parents definitely no more than 30 minutes a day. Uh, and especially for children under two to three years of age, to be very, very cautious about it. 
you know, even when it comes to learning, uh, there's some interesting uh, research that's been done uh, in California, I believe at Stanford University, where they found that tiny children learned more with an adult face-to-face -face than when they learned the same information from the same adult through a screen. So there's something special for children about the one-on-one -on -one interaction, especially with parents or someone they love, uh, being in the room with them, interacting with them, teaching with them, rather than learning through a screen. So that's my general feeling towards screens. You have to be very careful. These screens are designed to be addictive toward children, you know, for children. There's a reason if you go to Silicon Valley in California where they're making all this technology, those executives don't allow their own children to use screens. There's a reason for that. They're very, very cautious. They know about the dangers. And so you just have to be very careful. And what I say to parents is, if you have a choice, better to use a screen that's not in your child's hands, uh, you know, a monitor or a large television screen rather than to have something in their hands. One last thing, there are some concerns about, especially cell phones, the amount of radiation that's coming from cell phones, um, especially internet connecting devices tend to uh, have higher amounts of electromagnetic fields. And so we are a little concerned about the impact that that can have on a tiny child's brain being exposed to all those electromagnetic fields. So be careful. There's no reason that we should use your child to run an experiment to find what's safe for children and what isn't. It's just better to, to be safe. I think mom who asked this question, uh, she just um, um, thought about um, some presentations, for example, of cars presentations, which last just several minutes, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, cool. once, uh, yeah once I had an interview of a Polish psychologist who taught her uh, uh, kids to read uh, using the Doman method, and with one kid it was with uh, real cards, paper cards, but the other it didn't work and uh, she told him to read uh, using the screen only but she told me that um, he didn't um, watch anything any any cartoons anything just presentations of it that's all yeah. Yeah. and she claimed uh, that it didn't uh, do any harm because they are uh, teenagers now and, and she yeah well so you know you can accept that it's, uh, I, I i think that cards are the basis but Sometimes, uh, you know, when we, especially when we don't know the language, for example, we want to teach Chinese, uh, like uh, three minutes of presentation is okay. Yeah, <laughs> well, when, when, especially when it comes to teaching foreign languages, sometimes uh, screens are, are necessary. You know, for example, I often tell parents that if you want to expose your child to another language, one of the best places to go is to find songs on YouTube in that language that your child can watch and listen to. So I agree with you, screens, screens open up an entire new avenue for teaching children. And you, what you, you kind of described in your question is, is a good question, you know, is a good point where you said, this mom had one child who was happy to do everything on cards and another child who didn't seem to be that interested. And so the mom kind of adapted and used screens. Well, you know, even if you're doing like a typical reading program, let's say, where you're maybe doing 15 sessions in a day and each session is only five or 10 seconds, well, the child's exposure to a screen is very, very short. Um, so I, no, I don't think that would be dangerous. What I do say to parents is I, I say, look, if I have to choose, it's preferable to use cards uh, or a mix rather than just doing screens. Um, and, and there's just something fun about doing things on cards as well. So uh, that, that is kind of lost a little bit when, when you're both looking at the screen. So um, cards as much as possible, screens if necessary, and just be careful. That's, that's my advice. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so maybe next question from the chat. Uh, oh, hello, hi Spencer. I have a very important question. I have already asked it on um, your wall on Facebook, but I really can't wait for the answer. I have read recently an interview and, I, and it was mentioned that it was very harmful. Ah, so th this oh. is this question? Oh, it's a very s similar question. Very similar, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very similar one. Uh, let me read it to the end. 
uh, for kids up to the age of two to watch images emitted on the compu on computer, or maybe if it's even the same. Yeah, uh, the same <laughs> uh, as it could result in disappearance of synapt synaptic connection. No? I started to show lots of maps and books presentations to my 10 month old daughter, and I'm wondering now whether I should stop doing so or not. What's your yeah, opinion? My, my, look, my, from what I've seen from the research, um, the dangers of screens that they have found so far come when children are spending hours a day on screens, like two or more hours in a day. Now, that being said, I, I don't think we should even get close to that amount of time, especially for a child under three years of age. Uh, but uh, no, I think for brief moments during the day, um, there's, there's, there's no proof you know, demonstrating that that's dangerous for a kid. And let's admit it, some of us spent hours watching television screens, for example. So, um, you know, like I said, you just be safe, be conservative, but you're fine to do a bit of it. Thank you. And another question from the same mom. My daughter is 10 months um, and old and she started to stand by herself independently from age nine months. I can see she wants to walk. Should I assist her with fast steps or should I wait for her to try to walk by herself? Actually, can small kids learn walking without parents' help? I think they can. Yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. Small kids can uh, absolutely learn to walk without parents' help. And generally, our advice for mobility development is give lots of opportunity to move and actually try to kind of stay out of the way of your child's mobility development. So in, in my experience, what your child needs to be doing is a lot of creeping on hands and knees, because that's very good for developing the lower areas of the brain called the midbrain. And you know, your child might also be standing and holding onto objects and furniture and kind of like walking while holding the furniture. We call that cruising. Um, and that's a very uh, common intermediate step between creeping and walking. So the answer is don't try to help your kid. Uh, if, she needs, if she's creeping on her hands and knees, even better, because a, a lot of the Doman method work uh, focuses on the importance of the steps in mobility before walking. A lot of parents think of, you know, I want my child to sit and then walk, but actually crawling and creeping are far more impor important mobility milestones than sitting. And uh, so you just want to have your child move as much as possible and no, don't, don't try to help them too much. Mother nature will take care of the rest. Thank you. Okay, so we, as, as you've ordered the questions I, uh, questions I sent you, so you choose okay. <laughs> which next for the list. Okay, um, let's go to, okay, so there's a question here. I have two books for children aged one to three by Glenn Doman. Oh, I have to go for the book. I've forgotten about it. Okay, continue reading. <laughs> okay, the font is much smaller than he advises in his book about reading. Maybe I will show, a uh, nose is not toes to the camera. Oh, okay, I got this is your question. Um, Oh, okay. I will show it because I was wondering about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like that. And uh, yeah. Glendoman recommends uh, one or two inches. He, uh, he d d doesn't say precisely. And yeah. this is like, this is like, this is smaller. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe about a little bit more than one centimeter, something like that. Um, one and a half. One yeah. and a half. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So generally, when we start homemade books, we will begin with uh, a print size of about two to two and a half centimeters, okay? So that, that's just basically the beginner size. We find that's a very safe size to start with. Most, most children are very, very happy with that. That being said, uh, even that size that you see in nose is not toes, which is one and a half centimeters, um, most children, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and keep in mind that when, when we're starting homemade books, usually we're starting, you know, with kids over one year of age, because obviously there are steps that need to be taken before you get to homemade books in the reading program. So often at that age, children, children have developed enough vision to be able to tolerate that size. Now, there, I, I would like to say there are two things you have to pay attention to with homemade books. 
The first is the print size. The second thing is how many lines are on a page. Okay, so the, the issue is that size might be perfect if there's only one line or maybe two lines on a page. But if you take maybe a small child and you're putting five lines on a page, it might be too much text on a page and they will kind of get lost with all of the text. So for that reason, you want to have big print size, but you also want to have only a few lines on, on a page. And no, but I think older kids may get bored with just one line. My, my daughter had a stage like that when well, book with one line was just for one time and then she didn't want it. And when I put some more lines and maybe more even scientific information, she brought to, it to me um, uh, several times or even sure. more. So, yeah, there, there, so there are two kind of important things you mentioned there. The first thing is the print size itself. And then the, the second thing is the content, what you're writing about. So the, you know, keep in mind, you can have a big print size and also have very like sophisticated information in the book itself. The, the most important thing is that when you're showing the pages of text, you should see your child has visual interest in the page. So if your child is watching as you're reading, then you're, you're in good shape. It means the print size is large enough because children don't like to look at things if they can't see them clearly. So, but if, if you're trying to show your child pages of text and they're looking away, they're not interested, then it indicates that there's something wrong and that you might have to go bigger with print size or something like that. Okay, now question from the chat. I, Spencer, thanks for taking time to be with us. I wanted to ask you why there are no uh, rights anymore for printing. For example, how to teach your baby to read. I've asked in publishing house and they said there were problems with buying the rights. I have bought several books uh, in, in the internet, but I would love to be able to buy a normal paper version in Polish as a gift for everybody I know that has small children. Thanks a lot. So I think it's all about uh, the possibility of translating them into Polish. Mm. Okay. It, it's a good question. I've never personally looked into the this aspect of publishing in Polish, I'd have to ask my father, Douglas, who's more knowledgeable about, you know, the publishing rights and all of that. Um, I do know that some of the books were published in, in Polish some time ago. Uh, now they might be out of print. They're probably out of print now. Um, but I know I, I'm pretty sure, uh, Aga, you probably know better than me. I think How to Teach Your Baby to Read was published in, in Polish, but that was quite some time ago. So I'll, for that question, I'll just have to look into it and ask members of my family and, and see what can be done. Because I agree with you. I, I think that the books should be available in, in all languages. Yeah, I think uh, just two or three have uh, been translated into Polish and uh, the rest, you know, um, people who don't speak English so well, um, they, they just... Well, sir, certainly if anyone knows any... Um, any publishing companies that would be interested in publishing the other, you know, books in Polish, let, let me know. And in the meantime, I'll ask, I'll ask my father what, what the situation is. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, okay. Now, now maybe from the list, the question from the list. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, how long should we delay introducing numerals in math? until we cover everything that comes to our mind with dots? Okay, very good question. So uh, essentially, what, what I do when, with teaching math, I teach the quantities using the dot cards, and then I teach all of the operations uh, or equations, I'm not sure what the terminology is in, in Polish, using dot cards. So I would do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and then also combined equations as well with dots. Once I've done all of that with dots, I would typically start numerals at that point. Because at that point, you've really covered the most important things that should be done with dots. And also at that point, children are usually ready to start moving on and getting to more advanced math. And so usually we start numerals at that point. 
Oh, so it's not necessary uh, to introduce, I don't know, uh, roots, logarithm, and things like that with dot and be creative how to do it. <laughs> you can, you can, but over time, I've actually gotten to uh, to presenting numerals earlier and earlier, uh, just because because I found that for many kids, it it kept their interest higher uh, by introducing the numerals earlier. Yeah, most most kids, I uh, I think they are interested in numerals and in letters. Yeah. I, I had to hide one, one book <laughs> because of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, um, if a baby creeps a lot, but not cross pattern, is that good enough for the midbrain development? Similarly, if a baby creeps, but not cross pattern, is it good enough? Ah, it's the same repetition. How uh, come it is possible that the child will, will not creep or crawl cross pattern, but in the end can walk cross pattern. Okay, so let me, let me try to address this question in a, in a few ways. So uh, first of all, um, one of the, the most important aspects about any kind of, of mobility milestone, whether it's crawling on your belly or creeping on your hands and knees, is the cross pattern aspect because it, these activities require both hemispheres, both sides of the brain, to work in coordination with one another. So if you are seeing a lack of coordination in the child's creeping, uh, that, that's an indication that something in their midbrain, this lower area of the brain, is not completely organized. Now, I, I don't want to, first of all, I've, I've never seen your child before, the person who asked this question. And so I don't, the last thing I want to do is make you scared or upset. Um, just, you know, I, there are many, many people that I see uh, every day because, for example, at our Domain Method course, we have parents who are coming to the course and we tell them, please, you know, get down and crawl and creep. And, you know, I've seen uh, CEOs of international companies get down and they, they can't crawl or creep very well. So that by itself does not mean that necessarily that the child is going to have any major developmental issues. But what I would say is that it means there's an increased likelihood of some kind of neurological issue that the child might need to have addressed. And I, I'm not sure... Did, Again, this question, does it say how old the child is? Uh, no, but uh, maybe we'll... That, um, okay. Uh, so, okay, but... So, yeah. Ixol, <laughs> if you can maybe um, type uh, the child's uh, age. If I can maybe butt in, it was oh, theori okay. theori theoretical question. So basically, there's oh. no child attached to it. Oh, it was okay. uh, bugging my mind as oh, in... Okay. <laughs> You know, if a baby, for example, is on the belly and, and crows and it's not cross pattern, but then creeps cross pattern, what does it mean? Or similarly, if the baby does not uh, crow cross pattern, but then walks cross pattern, is it actually something that we need to look into? Well, um, <laughs> not necessarily, it? but I do think it's something that that should be observed uh, by by the adults in in the child's environment. And if necessary, you know, even with our well children, uh, we will often do crawling and creeping with them as they get older, three to four years of age, just because we find that when we go back to these kind of primitive activities that are, you know, basically controlled by these low areas of the brain, we find that when we do those activities, it helps overall brain function. So very often with four, five, six-year-olds, we will do crawling and creeping in, in the home with them. But I, look, I, I just don't want to make any statements that uh, it, there's, I can't answer this question for all children. I would just say it, it needs to be observed. And if a child does not have a good crawling or creeping coordination, it means that they're at a higher likelihood of having some kind of developmental issue. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I have a question um, connected to this. Um, uh, can a child um, who crept and crawled cross pattern um, uh, lose this uh, cross pattern <laughs> somehow? Um, I, I've seen, 
okay, so it, let's exclude the possibility of some kind of brain damage, right? Which would completely change how the brain functions. Um, I have seen some children who have not crawled and crept in a long time. And when you ask them to crawl or creep, in the beginning, it's a little bit disorganized because it's almost like they, it's, it's been so long, it's like they've almost forgotten. But usually if you do it with a child, maybe over several days, you'll find that the coordination will get very smooth and will, you know, there, you'll see the normal cross pattern come back. Oh, so this happened to my daughter. Okay. Because, uh, she, she, uh, yeah, she uh, crawled and creeped for a long time. Um, I, I wasn't aware of uh, this cross uh, pattern then, but I think it, it was so long, it was cross pattern. And then uh, when she was two and a half, uh, she uh, just used one leg uh, or uh, she, she uh, didn't bend the other, but she started creeping on her, just on her own initiative when she was almost three and after seven days it was perfectly. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's like very so Jordan said it was um, uh, not very um, synchronized, but cross pattern, so. Uh -huh. I think we can accept that. <laughs> okay. So uh, next question. Um, choose it from the list, maybe. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have a question here about the, it's, it says, what about the breathing program? Uh, is there anything else apart from the bag? So, okay, this question is coming from someone who obviously knows about the Domain Method program for kids with special needs. Uh, because in our respiratory programs, we, we have certain programs that we will only do with children with brain injury or with developmental problems. And so they're asking a question about our breathing program, which is a major part of that program for, for kids with special needs. And to answer your question, yes, we have uh, three different re you know, respiratory programs that we use with with children. Uh, now we purposefully, just to let you know, we, we purposefully don't talk much about these programs or even post uh, photos or videos of them because of child safety. Uh, we, you know, these are things that have to be monitored by a doctor and a physician. Uh, we're, you know, we're talking about children with, with health and developmental issues and so we have to be very careful and responsible about what we share and post online. But the respiratory part of our program plays a huge role for, you know, kids, kids with special needs. And so the, the answer to that question is yes. We have, we have various different programs that we do. Um, okay, thank you. Um, one more question. Uh, could you please elaborate about the importance of breathing exercises for healthy, well kids? I should, uh, should parents focus on some specific exercises or natural mobility exercises like creeping, running, going to park outside? Would it be enough, uh, would it be enough for a well yeah. kid? Yes. So for an, an average, if we're just talking about an average child who's developing normally, yes, any kind of active physical, you know, any physical activity can help develop breathing and respiration. And so, yes, we would not do any specific respiratory intervention for an average child, we would just say, let's make sure that the child is getting uh, lots of physical opportunities during the day. Uh, you know, most children should be getting an hour, about an hour of moderate to vigorous physical activity during the day. And uh, physical activity has so many benefits to it. Uh, for, for child development. And, and there's a reason why, for example, schools that incorporate physical activities have higher test scores with their students. It's because kids need physical activity. And unfortunately, over time, we've become more and more a society which expects tiny children to sit in chairs all the time and learn, learn, learn. Uh, and that's not how children are meant to develop. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of research and studies in this regard. So uh, honestly, for if you have a well child, you should be going out for walks and runs every day. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a healthy practice. It's a good practice as a family just to be together as well from the social aspect. Um, you know, even I don't have children, but my wife and I take walks together every single day 
because it's a good opportunity to actually get away from the craziness of life and spend some time together. So I, I even recommend this for marriages, not just for parents uh, with kids. But, but overall, get your kids out. You know, I would try to do at least 30 minutes a day, maybe up to an hour, and they should be uh, running as, as much as possible during that time. Thank you. Now, questions from the list? <laughs> oh, questions from the list, right. Okay, <laughs> Just like, let's take turns. Okay. So, here's another math question. To what extent, 30 months is the limit for dots when it comes to math, what are the chances that dots will work if we start with a three-year-old child or older? Okay, really good question. And, uh, okay, so all, all I can do here is speak from my experience. Uh, I've never seen a child older than, than four years of age who is able to, to learn the quantities using the dot cards on their own, okay? Now, that being said, I, I, I always like to give like an extra piece of information. You know, there are many people in the world that need to have the ability to recognize quantities as a part of their jobs, right? So for example, if you followed a cowboy around, right, who has uh, 200 cows uh, and he's riding in, I don't know, the plains of, of Texas, uh, he will look at his group of cows and he'll know if one of them is missing. And, you know, so humans do have this very amazing ability to look at quantities and, and recognize them if you have a need to do so. And so if my, I guess my short practical answer, if I had a child that was over four years of age, instead of doing the kind of typical dots program that you see uh, outlined in the book, I would work on quantities up till 10. And one of my favorite things to do with a child is using uh, poker chips. I go, when I say poker chips, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think maybe I can show one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if you have one, that would be great. Um, but I like to use poker chips because like dots, they're symbolic, they're small, they're easy to, to handle. Okay, and, and basically what I would do is I would sit at a table with a child. Okay, you have one there? Very nice. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I get you prepared. Good job. Um, <laughs> I didn't expect that, but I just like them. <laughs> we play with them. <laughs> So for example, I would sit at a table across from a child. I would put maybe three poker chips in front of them. And I would say, you know, Lisa, that's three. And then I'd take away the three poker chips and I'd put five. And I'd say, Lisa, that's five. I'd take them away. Lisa, that's one. Take it away. Lisa, that's seven. And it's, it's very similar to doing the dots. Uh, but I, I've actually found that for older children, I think because it's something hands-on, uh, it's something that uh, they can relate to, uh, it seems to be very effective in, in getting the kids recognizing quantities. And over maybe two weeks' time, three weeks' time, very often the children can do it themselves very quickly. So now parents can put five and child looks and says, five, good job, you know three, the kid says three, and the parent says, great job, you know. And so it can become a, a very positive way of starting to teach quantity recognition. Math, of, of any subject that you're ever gonna teach your child, math is very foundational. Uh, and if a foundation is weak in math, everything above it will be weak, right? So if a child doesn't have a good grasp of quantity, uh, for them to learn operations, right? If your child doesn't understand what four is, it's gonna be very difficult for them to know what four plus three is because they don't have a kind of grasp or understanding of the quantity. And just like subtraction is the inverse operation of addition, so if you understand addition well, subtraction is easy to understand, right? And if you understand multiplication well, it, division is easy to understand. So you really need to make sure that your child's foundations in math are very, very strong. And this is one area where I believe 
that the way math is taught in the East is much better than the way it's taught in the West. That if you look at what countries do best in terms of math education, it's usually Asian countries. And, you know, often what happens, like let's take the United States. The United States is a, if you look at it compared to the other countries of the world, it's one of the lowest ranked countries in terms of math scores. And usually around nine years of age, you start to see the Asian countries getting stronger and stronger and the US and, and European countries getting weaker and weaker. And they often, you know, often, you know, experts will say, we need to improve our secondary education and, you know, um, or our later elementary years. But in my opinion, the problem is foundational. You know, how can a child learn percentage or long division if they don't, if they can't quickly add or subtract or multiply? So it, it's very important to make sure that your children have a good grasp of quantity. And then the second important part of this is that they can do operations very, very quickly, right? So if, if you look at a, a kid who's strong in math, you say to them, what's, you know, eight plus four, and they say 12, right? If a child needs to use their hands to do it, it means they're, they're too slow. And so one of, one of the most important parts of the math program is really getting it so that your child can answer you almost instantaneously when it comes to operations. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's really interesting because it's something, you know, that is not to be found in books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and a lot of the things, you know, I, I have experienced teaching uh, in early childhood education. So when I was teaching kids who were three, four, five, six years of age, I had to, you know, sometimes I'd see kids and I can see that they're just, even at five, they're still not confident with a lot of these simple things in math. And, you know, I had to develop other ways of, of getting them. Started. So yeah, that's what I found works best. Thank you. Um... Uh, oh, I have a uh, hi Spencer. Thank you for your time. I have a question about uh, teaching twins. I started when they were four months old. Now they are fifteen months old. Old. Is it better for them to separate them for the sessions or to do it together? Uh, it's of course, of course, difficult to learn to teach them together because they are moving a lot. But maybe it's better for them when we are learning together. What's your opinion? Have you ever experienced something like great, that? Great, great, great question. And <laughs> actually, this is a, a common issue, not, not necessarily for twins, but you know, a lot of parents want to teach multiple children at the same time. And the, there are a few ways that we can try to address this. The general rule is that any child can attend a learning session in the household. The rule is they cannot distract the others, okay? And I guess my advice would be to try to change the dynamics a little bit of how you're doing the, the program. Because you're right. If you're trying to get two children to be attentive and quiet at the same time and sit and learn, that's going to be challenging. But maybe if you change the dynamics a little bit where you... You, uh, by the way, Aga, does it say how old the children are? Because I, I'm trying to get... Uh, yeah, uh, 15, 15, now 15 months, uh, but she started when they were four months. Okay, so, okay got it. So, uh, <laughs> they're so, on the long method for uh, almost a year now. Yeah, so I, especially for older, let's just talk a little bit about older children. So if you have older twins, it's better to say, or older children, it's better to say, you know, mom or dad is going to do the, a reading session now. We're going to look at names of animals. You can come and sit if you want. If no, go and but the rule is no one can distract during the session. And so that way the children basically have a choice. They can come and learn or they can come and do, go and do something else. And most of the time, children want to be involved. Most of the time, kids want to be with their parents. They want to learn. They don't like to be left out. So if they see their brother and mom learning, they'll want to come and sit with you. Uh, rather than the other dynamic, which is you trying to get both kids 
you know, involved at the same time. So that, that would be my first recommendation. Uh, and yeah, so I think the best thing is try to do it with the two of them together. If it doesn't work out, let one of the kids go and teach what, you know, the, the child who wants to be there. And over time, you know, you'll find as the kids get older and more mature, they will both want to, to be there with you. Yeah. Keep in mind also, a 15-month-olds want to be moving all the time. So it is challenging. You know, their brains at that point, they're really focused on mobility development. And typically, 18 months to three years of age is a challenging time to get children to settle. They want to move a lot. And you shouldn't feel bad or guilty if it's difficult for you to get them both sitting at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> Glenda Man writes about uh, the age between 12 and 18 months as the most challenging. <laughs> so yeah. maybe it, it has changed. <laughs> <laughs> I experienced that it stopped being challenging for me to um, get my daughter focused uh, on the cards uh, when she was um, almost two, mom two years old. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's true. Even for some kids between 12 and 18 months is, is a difficult time. Uh, but yeah, typically 18 to, to 36 months are the most challenging. And also, um, interestingly, those are also, that year and a half is also the time of the most rapid development of children. Like if you look at an 18 month old and a three year old, they're completely, like two completely different human beings. Uh, speech is developing, comprehension, uh, mobility, the child starts running during that time. So they, they become much more capable individuals. They just, they need during that time a lot of physical activity. Thank you. Okay, now maybe you choose the question from the list. Oh yeah, my turn again. Okay. Um, here's a question. A four month old baby has been having a special program with a physiotherapist once per week due to rigid muscles and asymmetry. Uh, in addition, Shantala massage is used. What does the Doman method suggest in such cases? Another question regarding the same baby. When he lies down on his tummy, his hands move sideways and he lies down like a, and he lies down like a frog. He gets tired and nervous quickly. Okay. Uh, th this is, this is a challenging question just because I've, I've, it's a very, very specific question and I've never seen this child before. I, it, if you want like a very kind of general answer, um, you know, it, we, a few things, first of all, uh, we do have an online course for, you know, parents of kids with special needs. Uh, it's called the Doman Method course. Uh, and I, I highly recommend it for the parents of this child. It, in the course, we talk about a program called the Inclined Floor, which is a special environment which is set up for children who uh, have developmental issues and who are unable to crawl. So I, I think for this child, they, the parents of the kid really need to, to take that course and start the interventions that are recommended in the, in the course. Because we, with a situation like the one you're talking about, you, we don't wanna be patient. You know, if, if a child has some kind of developmental problem, they require a physiotherapist already. Um, let's do as much as possible for the kid. And typically, for a child with a neurological problem, if you put them on their bellies, it's very difficult for them to learn how to crawl because they don't have the, you know, neurological ability to coordinate their movements or the strength ability to coordinate their movements to move forward on the flat floor. And so for that reason, putting them on an inclined floor allows gravity to help them begin the process of, of crawling. So now they're kind of crawling down a hill, which is much easier on a smooth surface than crawling on a flat floor. So I, I would recommend to, to take the Domain Method course. You can also read the book if you're able to read in English. There's a book called Fit Baby, Smart Baby, Your Baby, uh, written by Glennon Douglas Doman, 
which is all about uh, physical development of tiny children. I would also recommend that. And uh, as far as I know, there is also a course uh, in Italy with the Polish translator. Is that That's right. Yeah. So yeah. we. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah, we. Because I'm not sure um, if this question was from the mom who just couldn't uh, be here, or maybe from mom. Yeah. Asking so that's right. We also do a live at at because we have a center outside of Pisa, Italy, where we do the Domen Method course, the same as the online course, but we do it live, and we've had Polish translation in the past. And believe it or not, uh, I, this was before my time, but in uh, the 1990s, there were times where we were filling entire rooms just with Polish parents to do the course. Uh, that's what my parents have told me, once they did it for 200 Polish parents at a time. Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, one boy mentioned in Glendoman's book, uh, Tom, Tomek Luński, mm -hmm. yeah, he, he, was, he was Polish, and Tomek he showed Lewinsky, me that... Yeah. that uh, Kids can read or something like that. Yeah. I, I read it a long time ago, so I don't exactly. remember exactly, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, another question. Uh, are you or someone from the Institute planning to visit the UK for the conference in the nearest future, preferably London? Uh, <laughs> currently, there are not any plans to, to do any lectures in London. Um, I would be more than happy to come to any location to do a lecture. And uh, I know I've been bothering Aga about this, so I highly recommend all of you join me and try to encourage her to do the same thing because I'd also love to come to Poland to, to do it. But basically what, what we need for me to come to a location to do a live lecture, um, and it depends if we're doing a, a lecture for live or uh, sorry, we're doing a lecture for children who are well, like well average children, or if we're doing a lecture for kids with special needs. Uh, but the most important thing is that, first of all, we have a community in that location who wants, you know, this information. And if we have that, then we can, we can travel there to, to teach uh, people. So if you have someone in London who you think could help, uh, you know, in organizing an event like that, I'd be more than happy to go. We've done lectures in London in the past. Thank you. <laughs> now your turn for choosing the question. All right. Okay, question. When should we stop presenting reading cards? Oh, I like that question. Okay, um, so typically we will stop showing reading cards when a child is reading independently. So when I say reading independently, it means that they can pick up a book that they've never seen before and uh, they're able to read it without help from parents. Uh, typically at that point, it's not necessary anymore to show single words. Uh, now, keep in mind, single words are effective way of teaching regardless, you know. It, even when I was teaching children who are eight, nine, 10 years old, I would take important vocabulary words that they were learning in school and in class and showing them the words on cards. Of course, they are older children, so I don't need to show them on large pieces of cardboard anymore. I can show them on, on tiny pieces. It just turns out that it's a very effective way of, of teaching kids. But yeah, the, to answer your question, when a child reads independently, usually we will, we will stop showing single words and just focus on reading books. Okay, so um, I have the same problem with Spanish <laughs> because uh, we are, uh, you probably know, but we are using Braille kids because I, I don't, I started speaking Spanish, but just a little. And uh, uh, quite recently after completing one semester there and um, half of the other, my daughter, um, she, she, she doesn't want single words, phrases, she wants books because there are books online. So um, I, uh, I'm just wondering if, if this is the point where I, um, when I should buy her books in Spanish or create some books in Spanish because she, uh, she just wants me to skip everything else. She doesn't, well, it, she doesn't want it yeah, anymore. That's, that's quite typical because, you know, sometimes children are just like, no, no, I just want books now. No more words, that, that, what you're mentioning is, is quite common. And 
what I will usually do for children in that situation, I'll say, okay, we'll do books, but you know, because we still need to, you know, keep working on your reading before we read a book, I'm going to show you the words you're going to see in the book. So for example, you take some keywords from the book and you show them to the kid and then you go ahead and read the book. And for most children, they'll say, okay, mom is preparing me to read the book. So they'll be kind of understanding and more interested because they also know after the words, they get a book afterwards. So they know they get their room. Okay, thank you. So I'll try that <laughs> because you know this is a uh, uh, fourth language uh, in, in the reading program. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't really know if if she can she can surprise me uh, yeah, from yeah. time to time. Um, and there are some um, uh, problem solving opportunities, but when she wants, uh -huh. sometimes she chooses uh, the word and she's three years old, so she tells me. Well, but they they say choose choose uh, gato and she says but oh, why not perro and, and she chooses the, the other one uh -huh. <laughs> yeah okay so i'll try uh, okay so i'll try to to create uh, to, to, to create some paper cards with those words and just uh, present her the book online and i'll buy some books because i think okay i think uh -huh. this is the time uh, thank you my daughter is uh, 15 months old we have read about 650 single words, 200 phrases, 200 sentences. Now we are reading homemade books. Should I still show each new uh, word from book individually? My daughter is not interested in single words in Polish. Yeah, so I would answer, by the way, to whoever asked this question, you're doing a great job. And probably at this point, the, the two programs, the two parts of the reading program you should be doing are homemade books and single words. And just like what I said to Aga, I think that before you show a homemade book, it's a good idea to show the words that will be in the book. So, and you do it right before. You say, look, we're gonna read your book about elephants. You love this book. So let's see some words that you're going to see in the book. So elephant, trunk, Africa, so, you know, and so you give, you give words that will be in the book and then after five words, you read the book. And most of the time, the children will be very happy. But what, what if, <laughs> if the book contains more, much, uh, many more words? Yeah, then... The, then Don't you have to introduce all of them, like 30? You, know, no, so you, you can't do that, unfortunately, because um, the thing is, if we say to the kid, no, we're not going to show you the book until you've seen all the words first, the child will say, you know what, I'm done. So we, we, have, to, we have to work with the child. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so, and by the way, uh, some parents ask me that. They say, oh, I cannot show a homemade book yet because I have not shown all the words that will be in the book. And what I say is, look, don't be a perfectionist. If there are some words in the book that your child hasn't seen, don't worry about it. Because the, the more important thing is that we need to keep your child really loving the reading program. If your child doesn't like the reading program, we're not going to get any results anyway. So, um, you know, homemade books are the soul of this reading program. It, and a lot of parents focus too much on single words and not enough on books, but books are the real heart of, of the program and where we get our success. The single words are just to support. Thank you. And uh, one more question for me about the reading program. Can we believe a three-year-old who says, uh, this is the, the situation with German cards, um, uh, she, she says um, uh, something like, uh, I know, after the second presentation maybe, she says, I know this, these cards, prepare new. And, and when I prepare new ones, she looks. <laughs> but is it, is it possible because this is, you know, we have so many languages and, and she can say something like that. No, no, not these cards. You have to prepare it, new. It's very possible, yeah, that, that she's, uh, she's learning them. And uh, yeah, it, you know, if, if you want, now that she's three, you can start to get more active with the program where you can start playing games with the words where you say, okay, let's play some games where we match words with pictures or something like that. So that way she starts to have an opportunity to kind of actively use the program because some, some children, yes, they can learn to read words very quickly and they don't need it. And other children, maybe they're just 
they want to move faster with the program, so they tell parents that. You know, so um, by doing active games with them where we say, okay, let's match words with pictures, uh, or let's put out some words and find one word that does, that's not in the, in the category. So you put out three animals and you put one word, which is, you know, um, an object or something like that. And you say, what word doesn't belong? So you can play different kinds of games with kids where it's more active and they're not just sitting and passively getting the program. Oh, thank you. This will be very useful for our German because I don't speak it at all. And I just presented, she, she knows some words because she, um, we use something that is called little pim and the, the, there are some elements of reading. So she knows some, some of them, but um, most of the words are completely, you know, um, just words for her and she doesn't know the meaning. Uh -huh. So maybe with pictures, she will get the, uh, get the meaning. Of, mm -hmm. of them. And exactly. Crazy because she, uh, she says, for example, that this and this is a uh, grapes in German. And I have to use the dictionary. Yes, really, really. <laughs> <It's great. laughs> so, uh, yeah. kids are amazing, but it's hard to believe, really, still, yeah. <laughs> after so many, so many years <laughs> of doing that. Okay, um, next question. I have a, a question about a child with uh, congenital hypotonia. How can I stimulate his speech? The child is being rehabilitated since three months old and generally such children have a problem with speech and start speaking later than ch children without such a problem in the, at the same age. Maybe you could advise some other exercise to improve her general condition, physical and mental. Yeah. Okay. So a, a few recommendations and... Uh... You know, the, the first is, I'm, I'm not sure if, if the person who asked this question has already read Glenn Doman's book, Glenn, my grandfather. He wrote a book called What to Do About Your Brain Injured Child, which is all about children with neurodevelopmental conditions. And I, I definitely, for, for this child, recommend it. Hypotonia means a lack of muscle tone. And that is a result of um, something that is happening in the brain, right? It's not actually a muscle problem. It's because the brain controls everything in the human body. And so very typically when there's a brain injury, uh, muscle tone, strength, uh, you know, joint flexibility, these things are, are affected. So I think you should read what to do about your brain injured child. Like I told the other parent who, who asked the question, I, I would also recommend the the Doman Method course as well, online if you speak English or live if you, if you speak Polish. And, uh, and by the way, when I recommend the course, it's not because I'm, I don't wanna answer your question, it's because in the course there are 25 hours of lectures where we cover everything. And there's just no way in a five minute answer that I could provide you with much information that would, that would be useful. Now, everything in Glenn Doman's books, all the programs that we recommend for well children come from our programs with children with special needs. And uh, so Aga mentioned Tommy Lunsky, for example, who was a child with big physical problems uh, because of, of brain damage, uh, but he learned to read at three years of age. And he was very important for my grandfather to, to learn not just about the potential of children, but also what are specific activities that we can do with children, which is good for brain development. So I, I highly recommend you look more into Doman International's work with children with special needs. And uh, I think you're, you're gonna have to follow this course for this child because it's, it's, it's really important that we address all of their, their underlying neurological problems. Thank you. And we have three more questions on the list though. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, my, the next question, it says, how to help my son? Uh, he hunches, he sits in the W shape, and movements are awkward and not stable. Um, and just in case people don't understand, the W position is when, um, do you, uh, Aga, do you know the word in, in Polish for this position? Do you, do you understand uh, what it is? Siedzi w pozycji W. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. I like the, you know, like this letter. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't, I, but, well, to tell you the truth, I, I was trying to imagine it, I think with legs uh, sitting yeah. on, on uh, it's a... It's when a 
to it's, with legs uh, with feet um, on yeah. each side, something yeah, like that. Right. Like the children like to sit when they uh, sit on on, on chair um, on chairs in front of computers, something like that. Right. Yeah, so many many like children uh, will sit back, but their legs are behind them. So um, they're. It, it creates a position that looks like a W with their legs. And this is a very, it's a very bad position for children to sit in. And uh, because it's an abnormal position to be in, and it's not good for joint development. It's not good for the joints in the hips or in the knees or in the ankles. So if you ever see your child sitting in, one of, in, in this position, you should just tell them, no, we don't sit like that. Um, so, but everything in this question, you know, hunching, hunching over, sitting in a W position a lot of the time, um, again, these are signs of abnormal mobility development. And again, the, the Doman method was, you know, my, my grandfather, Glenn, was a physical therapist. So he designed, you know, his, his whole goal in life really was to try to fix mobility problems with children. And so I, I highly recommend for the parent who asked this question, again, look into the Doman Method course, read the books I recommended, What to Do About Your Brain Injured Child, and Fit Baby, Smart Baby, Your Baby, and consider coming to the course in the future. Aga, are you still there? It looks like you've frozen. All right, I'm going to keep going. Everyone, if you can still hear me, can you post uh, in the chat box that you can still hear me so I, I know I can keep going? Okay, good. All right, Aga can hear me. All right, very nice. Great, thanks everyone. Okay, so I will continue and hopefully uh, Aga can join me again. Let me see what other questions I have. Hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions here. Let me go to the chat box. And let me see what other questions are here in the chat box. Okay, so there's a question here. Could you please give us more examples of problem solving games for the reading program? I am not a creative person. Okay, yeah, so I gave examples before, in case you missed it, about matching words and pictures, and uh, also trying to find the word that doesn't belong. Uh, so you put out some words and one word that doesn't fit, and you ask the children to do it. Uh, another, another option is to do things like, you take words that are activities, like uh, kick, and uh, stand up and sit down, you know, and, and you say to the child, okay, pick a word and then do it. So the child points to kick and they go and kick, you know, and then they point to something else and they do it. So doing activities that uh, relate to the words are really fun because children like to be active, they like to be mobile. So the more you can mix those activities together, that's a really good idea. Um, what else? Okay, taking a, a category of words, right? And you say something like, you love elephants. Elephants are your favorite animals. I'm gonna show you some words, and when I get to elephant, you shout stop. So you show the words, and when you get to elephant, you know, the child says stop. And you say, good job, you found elephant, let me put that down. Oh, and you really like the giraffe. Can we find giraffe? Tell me to stop when we get to giraffe. So doing activities like that, where you're, again, actively having the child participate is really, really good. Uh, there, you can really, you can do so many things, like taking single words, and you put all of the words upside down so the child cannot, um, you know, cannot see the words. And you hold up a picture, so maybe you hold up a picture of, uh, you know, television, and you say, okay, let's see if you can find this word. So they flip over one word, you know, and they, they flip over the words until they find the word television. So again, it's an active way of them connecting the pictures with the, the words. As much as possible, when you can connect images with words, it's a very good way to keep a child engaged in, in the program. 
All I'm right. Sorry, my internet connection. <laughs> oh, you're back. Very good. We got worried there for a second. With my phone, I just have all the internet on my husband's phone. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so wh where are you now? Have you finished? Okay. So I just a answered the last question um, about. Uh, you know, more examples of problem solving games for the reading program. So I answered that. Um, and I guess somehow when you got kicked off, I lost access to the document with all the questions. So I think there was one more question there. Do you uh, have it there? The last uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so you, you've already said something about social development. Oh no, I didn't answer that. No, okay, okay, so, okay, I, I haven't lost the document, so it's okay, but I can't see the chat. I don't yeah, know. So there, there was one question about social development, and is there any place to read about the domain method and, and social development? And mm -hmm. inter interestingly, uh, it's, it's like the one topic that the, the domain family has not yet written a book about, and it's... Uh, at the top of the list of priorities for us to do. So, uh, but no, we, we, there's no place yet where you can like read up on our, our recommend, you know, our recommendations for, for programs. Um, so yeah, uh, if, you know, may, maybe we could do a whole webinar just about social development and I'd be happy to do that in, in the future because it, it's such a important topic for children. Um, you know, for, for me, and maybe this is a surprising thing for parents to hear me say, uh, especially because we talk all about cognitive development and physical development and health, but for me, social development is one of the most important areas of development because it, you know what, if a person is intelligent and physically fit and healthy, but they're not mature or they're not kind, or they're not likable, um, they're not going to live a very happy life. Uh, and, and so I've, I've, over time, I've become very, very passionate about, you know, how to raise children who are mature and capable and kind. And, and so it's, it's a very important topic. And, uh, and maybe we have to do another webinar just about that sometime. Okay, I'm like a note of that. Okay, I've lost um, part of the chat because um, so maybe you can you can read the next questions from the chat. And I have one more here. Sure. Um, okay, someone asked the question: Can we make a single word book? I introduced new vocabulary in the form of books with single words, then two to three word sentences, and a picture with every sentence. the The answer is absolutely yes. You can do that. And if you have a child who hates words for whatever reason, some kids are like that, um, the best way to do it is to do a homemade book just with single words, where you have one or two words and a picture afterwards. And for most children, that makes them very happy and you get your single words into the program. Next question. Um, yeah, the last one from the list. So uh, my daughter is now two years old. While I was pregnant, I came to know about this Doman program. I got interested. I was not able to buy all the books they published. Uh, I bought only math reading program books. After delivery, I was not able to do the program properly with my kid. She's uh, two years old. Um, up until now, I was able to finish only 50 dot cards, lots of personal uh, reasons, my health, depression, family issues. This is a very long question. I can't pick up myself to do this program with her, but I very much like this program and want to teach my kid. I, re I read in ma the math book, we can teach dot cards uh, up to 30 month, uh, months of the child age. After that, they won't show interest in dot cards. But she's 24 months only now. When I start uh, started the, the dot cards, she's not showing the interest. Did I miss the window of opportunity to teach her? Has anyone successfully taught a two-year-old or above? Um, um, kids successfully uh, dot cards. Please share some tips for me how to do this program regularly with my child. 
I have some doubts related to math. I'm teaching her fraction, algebra, even, odd, prime, greater than, less than, inequalities, equalities, etc. using dot cards. What other math can I teach with the, uh, the DOM and dot cards apart from what I mentioned above um, and for basic math operations? What else can I teach in math? I think of You've um, answered this question, yeah, so a similar think, one, yeah, at the, at the very I beginning. I think to address the kind of bigger question that this mom is asking is, it, and I, I kind of laugh a little bit, but it also makes me sad, this fear that many parents have that they have a child who's two, three, four, or even five years old, and this feeling that, oh my gosh, I've lost the most important phase of my child's life. There's, I've, I've, you know, I'm a terrible parent, you know, this, this, uh, and, you know, I, I, I always tell parents, um, there, it doesn't, honestly, of course, it's best to start as young as possible with the child, but most children that are exposed to the Doman Method program don't start at birth. They start several years into life when parents happen to learn about the program. And for those children, the results can be exceptional as well. The, the other thing that I, I say to parents, and I think a lot of people don't take this very seriously, but I think it's very, very important. If someone asked me, what's the number one most important thing about the Doman Method? Uh, is it the reading cards? Is it math? Uh, I would say it's none of those things. It's how we speak to children. And, you know, a lot of research now shows that children who grow up in homes where parents speak to them with a large, rich vocabulary, that those children have much larger speaking vocabularies themselves. And that is, a, that is one of the greatest gifts that you can, can give a child. Uh, because if a child has an excellent grasp of their own language, or even better, other languages, um, it, it just provides them with a huge advantage in their life. Yeah, so to give you one example of this, um, so I, I have a sister-in-law, my, my wife's sister, and she had a, a son, very, very young. And she knew all about the Doman Method because of course my wife and I are, are passionate uh, users of it. But because she was very young and she had a child, she had so many other issues in her life she had to focus on. And so honestly, doing reading cards, doing the math program, it was very, very difficult for her. And she only did a very tiny amount. But my nephew grew up in an environment with a family who really respected his intelligence. And you see, if you're a parent and you know that your child inherently is brilliant, uh, the way you speak to your child, the way you interact with your child automatically changes. And that provides such a huge advantage for, for a kid. So for, you know, for example, now, now my nephew is eight years old, but intellectually and emotionally, he's so far beyond other children his age. And it's, of course, we did some bits of intelligence, we did some reading words and homemade books, and that's nice. Uh, but, uh, but it's really because of how the adults in his environment interacted with him. And so if, if I would say anything to this mom, I would say, calm down, everything's fine. Uh, make sure first and foremost, you speak to your child in a way which is respectful and make every moment you can into a teaching moment. You know, my, my grandfather Glenn used to say that, he said, the magic is not in the cards, it's in the child. And so um, if you think of your child as this individual who just wants to learn everything about the world, you can be in any place and find a way to teach your child, right? Uh, you can be walking outside and talking about the different dogs that you're seeing while you're walking and the different flowers. And even if you don't know what they are, you say, you know, look at that beautiful flower, take it with you when we get home, let's go and find out what it is. And it, it, it creates an individual who has this open mindset toward learning and who has a genuine love of learning. And that, that's the greatest gift that you can give your kid. That's even better than single words or dot cards. 
is my favorite quote. The yeah. magic is in the, in the job too. there. I but still, I, I, I sometimes uh, get stressed that I, uh, for example, now I, in the evening I feel better, but during the day I, I just, there are days now when I don't do anything apart from speaking languages. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I feel guilty because I haven't presented any German words, for example. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, I think that, and by the way, I think that's very realistic. I'm sure that if, if you asked my own mom who did the program with four children, she would say something very similar that, and, and by the way, I, I also like to say that it's a part of parenthood, but especially for mothers to, to feel guilt about what they're doing. So I, I work with the, the most devoted and wonderful moms in the world. I mean, the mothers I work with, especially with mothers of children with special needs, you will never see such amazing parents in your life. But every single parent in one way or another feels guilt. It's just a reality, you know. Even my own parents who are the greatest parents in the world, you know, I, I can see sometimes if I say, sometimes I make a joke, you know, like I, here's a good example. So my mother did the most beautiful program with me and my three siblings. And I was having a conversation with them recently and I made a joke to my mom. I said, oh, you know, when I went to other children's birthday parties, they were so much fun and they had balloons and all those things. And, and I said, you know, at my birthday parties, we never had any of those things. It was like a cake and that's it, you know. And uh, I saw my mom go, oh. you know, like my mom felt guilty because my third birthday party didn't have balloons, you know. So that's, I, I think that's kind of a fact of, of being a parent and you shouldn't allow that to, uh, to govern you or control you. I really think that if, even if you're able to do one thing in a day, you really need to think about just saying, wow, I gave my child one more opportunity that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, and, and you really have to look at the, the wonderful positive interactions that you're having with your kid every day. Feeling, feeling guilt is not... I think, I think it's very easy to get uh, crazy about cards and, and yes. you know, yes, uh, consider them <laughs> something uh, very important. <laughs> we can't live a day without them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I, I don't know if I... Um, uh, so probably next question from the chat. But I, uh, yeah, well, there's a question here. Why do some babies and children develop faster and others slower? Is there any impact on future overall well-being. So absolutely, kids develop at, in, in different ways uh, and in different speeds. And, uh, and you know, it, it's not necessarily anything major or, or to get concerned about. For example, girls typically develop speech earlier than boys. You know, it doesn't mean anything uh, you know, serious uh, developmental issues about boys. But, but what, we, what, what is important is that there are overall, let's say, guidelines about when children should develop certain developmental milestones. And in almost any book written by the Doman family, you will find something in the book called the developmental profile, which is, it's a a profile that shows the important milestones in different areas of development and the age that the child should have those milestones. Now, some children will develop them a little faster, some a little slower, and that's absolutely fine. But if, you know, if a child is going on and on and they're not reaching those basic milestones, at a specific time, we need to start getting concerned and start focusing on improving their development. And that's, that's why we've created, you know, programs for, for kids with developmental problems. Okay, thank you. And maybe next one, because I, I, I think I can't see those who were before I disappeared. <laughs> I, I love these questions because I can tell that they're from parents who are, have been doing very intense programs. Like someone said, for multiplication, should we use an X or a dot sign? 
only a parent who's been doing the domain method for years would ask a question like that. Yeah, so, I was wondering once about division, you know, and I think I, I show I show both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The okay. So the answer is, you know, it, I get questions also like when I have a reading word, should the A look like this or should it look like oh, this? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. you know, yeah, these kinds of questions. And the, the actual answer is it doesn't really matter. Uh, the more important thing is that you're just consistent. So it doesn't matter if you use a dot or an X, just pick one of them and be consistent with it. Um, it that, the, the specific symbol is not so important, but you want to be consistent so your child sees it in the same way every time so they understand they're looking at the same thing every time. So, yeah. So, so the, the, the font doesn't matter either? The, the font doesn't matter either, no, just... Uh -huh. Okay, good, good to know, because I, I, um, I read some advice to use uh, this font sans serif, I think, sans oh, really? serif, uh, without those uh, decorations. No, I mean, I, I, tend, I, I tend to prefer uh, Times New Roman or Arial. Uh, just oh, really? <laughs> okay, good to know. I, I, I find them clean, and also apparently some studies have been done that show that they're easy on the human eye, you know. But, oh, I, actually, I started with Times New Roman, but uh, later on, after reading something, I, I, I changed into uh, different ones. <laughs> okay, I don't feel strongly about that. <laughs> All right, um, there's another question here. Oh, I've, I, I answered that. Oh, I've answered these other questions, let me see. Okay, so I have a. I, I, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing any questions here, Aga. Do you? Yeah, I see the last eight. Yeah, oh, mine. <laughs> a, lot, a lot more came. I see a question here from Justina that says, "Is carrying a sling recommended?" Justina, I think this might be an English translation issue. I don't know what uh, what you mean by sling. Um, it, maybe you can say in Polish or write in Polish and I'll... I'll yeah, I'll maybe write. just write in Polish and... Yeah. and, and. Okay. Um, someone is asking here, my question is more about reading and math methodology that is provided in the books. We were doing it until my son was 10 months. He is 12 months now and we had to do a break for moving reasons. Number one, do we start from the beginning or where we left off? So I would recommend you start where you left off. If you start from the beginning, he might be very, very bored. He might be like, oh, I saw these already. So just start where you left off. Uh, number two, he has been very mobile, all thanks to the physical part of Glenn Doman's book, creeping and crawling and climbing and hanging since very early because he is so mobile and he hates to be still. <laughs> Any recommendation, because there's no way to make it happy, enjoyable, when the child does not want to stay in one place. Okay, keep in mind he's 12 months old. And, and we did discuss this a little earlier. And, you know, again, mother nature has made tiny children to want to move. If, if you think about it, if you're 12 months old and you're starting to walk, your balance is very poor, right? And when your balance is poor, the world is a very dangerous place. So the way that humans are designed is that during the first years of life, we need to move, move, move to develop our, the balance areas of our brain so that we can confidently walk around and navigate our environment. So I actually think you're, uh, you need to change a little bit your attitude toward him because if you're thinking he has to sit down and get this program, He's a 12 month old, he wants to move. So I think that in, instead you need to be thinking, how can I give him many, many opportunities to move during the day? And then I'll give him very short sessions of uh, his reading program or math or whatever it is that I'm trying to do with him. Okay. Thank you. As for the sling, it's like um, um, a baby baby sling, a scarf with a ring sling, for example. Maybe you know some some uh, type of a baby carrier. Yeah, like a baby carrier. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So you don't call it sling. I find I found sling too. Good question. I found it like a baby sling or a type of a, a kind of a. Uh, 
A yeah. circle, ring sling? Yeah, good question. And to be honest, I'd like to ask my wife, who's more of an expert in physical development than me. And I think she's in the other room. Melissa? Uh, she's, not, she's not here. Um, I would be interested in the answer, too, because I used it with, with my daughter. Yeah. So, no. Yeah. Um, I will, I will, you know what, I will ask my wife, Aga, and I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, I think they do recommend a certain kind of carrier for children that's, that's the most natural in terms of, you know, just body development, but I, I need to ask them. It's, I'm a cognitive staff member, so some of these fine details I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I have a question here which was sent to me by Beata. How can I help my son with speech development? He is 18 months old and not speaking yet. We've been doing the reading program for six months now. Our pediatrician recommended a speech therapist for him, but I'm skeptical about it. Okay, so, you know, like I mentioned, Beata, uh, boys can be um, a little later in developing their speech than girls. And interestingly, one of the reasons why is uh, boys actually, we, we use fewer areas of our brain when we speak than, than women do. It's why women tend to have larger speaking vocabularies than men. Uh, it's just interesting. There's a neurological reason for it. So uh, a few things, uh, Beata. Uh, first of all, I have an entire free webinar on YouTube called Enhancing Speech Development for kids with special needs. And I, I highly recommend you, you watch it because I give some activities that you can do at home for speech development. So that's the first thing you can do that's very easy. And at least that way you can start with activities at home. Uh, I'm not sure if your child has any other developmental things that you're concerned about. Uh, and if your child gets older and you know, maybe he gets to two years and he's still not speaking and you're concerned, I think you should reach out to Domin International and we should talk about your child's uh, development. You know, uh, so many parents wanted our um, opinions about developmental milestones. I also made a free webinar on YouTube called Understanding Your Child's Development. Um, or maybe it's understanding your child's milestones. I, I, I need to find that. Um, Aga, maybe you could, you know, maybe I could send these links to you afterwards mm -hmm. and you okay, could post okay. them. Uh, because I, I want people to be able to find these videos. Um, yeah, so I, I'll send them to you, Aga, and then you can post them for people. Mm -hmm. So I have one about speech development <laughs> and I have one about developmental <laughs> milestones. Okay, um, I have a question from uh, Asia or uh, Asia. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. <laughs> Asia, Asia. <laughs> Asia, Asia. Thank you. Uh, I have two children, one 14 months and an older one who's almost three years old. We started one month ago with the method. At the beginning, my older son was very enthusiastic about new words. Currently, he <laughs> runs away. I think laughing, it's laughing, laughing. There's a laughing. Yeah, laugh, laugh, laugh. Session. He comes back soon. However, the impression is that he doesn't want to learn, but I can see that he wants. Should I take a break or continue? I don't know how to behave. Okay. Um, so, okay, this, it's, this is a little bit of a challenging question to answer because it, there could be many different dynamics at play here. But if you feel that he is interested in it, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure I would agree with you. And I, I think the most important thing is just to make sure that you're continuing to add new materials and new words into your program. Because one of the most common reasons why children get bored with this program is because parents are very slow in adding new things. Like parents are like, I need to show these many, many times because I'm afraid my child won't learn all of them. And that kills, often kills the child's interest in the program. So uh, make sure you're adding new materials. Um, make sure you're following the guidelines in the reading book about how to add new materials and get rid of old materials. Also, make sure that your sessions are very short. 
Remember, sessions should be five or 10 seconds long. If you're having long sessions, that might be the reason why he, he wants to leave. Thank you. And I, I think I, I can see uh, the other question. So I'd love to teach my three and a half year old boy reading or maths, but he has special needs. Lamshafe syndrome and hardly speaks. What uh, should I do? Plus, do you think uh, an MRI is necessary for children with neurodevelopmental delays? Yeah. Okay. So th this is, a, again, it's um, I just spoke about my webinar for children with, you know, for helping language development. So I recommend that for this child. Uh, I look, the issue with MRIs is that MRIs will show you if there's structural damage to the brain, but it doesn't actually help people very much in recommending treatment for the child. So even if uh, the doctor finds your child has some damage in the brain, they won't necessarily change their recommendations because of the findings. And what, what I would recommend for you is, uh, you know, again, looking into the, the Doman Method programs for kids with special needs. Um, I, I can definitely see from what you've written that it would be helpful for your son. And I'd recommend you, you, you consider the Doman Method course and read What to Do About Your Brain Injured Child by, by Glenn Doman. Thank you. Uh, another one. If a child reads or started to learn how to read using one of the traditional methods, is it still possible to introduce reading a program using the Doman Method? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So when, sometimes parents are even concerned. They say, you know, my child maybe is has learned to read somewhat in school. Uh, they've learned letters, they've learned phonetics, you know, can they get the Doman method, you know, side by side with what they've learned in the past? And the answer is absolutely. If anything, it will only help their reading ability to start the, the Doman method reading program. So yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, what um, if the child asks about the letters and is really interested? Um, should we answer? <laughs> or, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. If your child, you mean if the child's like, what's that letter or something like that? Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah tell them. <laughs> tell them. I mean, look, we we believe in honesty with children. So if they ask you a question, uh, you know, we recommend to give them the answer. So absolutely. And by the way, it's very typical for kids around three years of age to just start getting interested in things like letters and numerals uh, because kids tend to be interested in symbols. And uh, so, you, yes, you should tell them if they ask for it. Okay, thank you. I was a bit worried because my husband provides so. <laughs> and, and I know that she knows she even can write some words on the computer. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, so letters are very, you know, sometimes parents think that in the Doman method, we never teach letters. And we do teach letters when it comes time to start teaching writing or typing. Because obviously a child, to start forming words and creating words on their own, they have to know letters and they have to know how to find letters on a keyboard or how to write them. So yeah, very typically by three years of age with a kid who's been on our program, we'll start teaching letters. Mm -hmm. but, uh, oh, and one more uh, question about reading. Um, is it okay? Because uh, my daughter was diagnosed uh, by you <laughs> from <laughs> emails uh, that she can really read uh, in Polish and, and um, in English, but uh, once, um, uh, I just an old card fell. Uh, there was uh, it was written um, "dad" on it, and uh, she looked at it and she said his name, Arthur. So she didn't read what was written, but um, you know she she doesn't really read aloud. Uh, she prefers to pretend and read something else to, to invent her stories. But uh, just with this card, and it was really surprising for me that she didn't read "dad." But uh, she, she said Arthur. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and actually that, that's a good example of uh, a child showing indirectly that they can read, right? So that, so she didn't read the word exactly, but she, she did indirectly. She showed you she could read. And very typically when we play games with kids, kids tend to not like games 
where you're asking them to give back information you've taught to them. So if you hold up uh, the you know, word dad and mom and you say, where's daddy? Um, they're very typically, they feel like they're getting tested, right? But if you say something like, uh, you know, who do you like to watch TV with at night? Or you say, uh, who, who did you go to the zoo with on Saturday? Something like that. Um, the child now has an indirect way of answering your question and kids like that a lot more. Um, so it, it's just more fun for them. They feel like it's a game rather than a test. So it, it, that's kind of a good example of that. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, next question, how to come back to the reading um, and or math program after a few month break? Uh, should something be repeated or it's better just to continue with newer dots? Thank you a lot for this webinar. I, I'm sorry, I missed that, the beginning of that question. Can you say it? Uh, how to come back to the reading or math program after a few month break? I, I almost always recommend just picking up where you left off. Yeah, so you just kind of restart where you were. Don't go back to the beginning and start again. It's, it's just a recipe for disaster for many kids. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes, my daughter found a uh, back. Uh -huh, so it's a comment for the, for, for, for the question that was before. Um, I don't know which one. My daughter found a bug today and asked if you could check at home what kind of bug it is. Uh -huh, a comment, uh, you, you um, said something about the picking a flower and if you don't know a name, just yeah, check exactly. it. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I have uh, something like this with German because my daughter, she noticed that I have, I, it's really difficult for me to grasp this language and she always asks me, what is that in German? What is that in German? And I always say, oh, wait, <laughs> when we get home, I will find on my phone. Or yeah. if I don't well, you know, my, uh, you know, my grandfather Glenn used to say that children ask brilliant questions. They often ask the same questions that the greatest scientists in history asked. You know, they'll ask you questions like, why is the sky blue? You know, or uh, why is the grass green? And uh, a lot of adults are like, ah, you know, like silly question. Well, is it a silly question or is that actually a brilliant question? You know, uh, why is the sky blue? You know, and so uh, I think just it's an important attitude to always say to your child, uh, you know, that's a great question. Let's find out the answer to that. You know, let me make you a homemade book about that uh, rather than saying, oh, that's silly. You know, who cares? Uh, <laughs> or just saying, well, it, it's blue because it's blue, you know, no, it's not, you know, so, uh, yeah, have, have fun with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're we having fun. Aga, maybe we, we are can, old, you know. Aga, maybe we can do three more questions. Uh-huh, okay. okay. Are there any types of toys or equipment for babies, children that you would not recommend? I know about baby walkers, dummies, falsifiers, and screens. Is there anything else that may be harmful to the child's development? Oh, so she stole all of my answers. Uh, yeah, because I was going to say baby walkers, pacifiers, screens. Um, yeah, you know, there, there are lots of things out there that are made for kids you know, kind of like to, to keep them physical. Like I see these um, like jumpers now, like I don't know if those are popular in Poland, but they're, they're kind of like something that kids are put into and they can jump up and down. Yeah, you, you put them in the frame, uh, in the door frame. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, things like that. You know, even play pens, you know, like environments that are enclosed. Of course, sometimes you need to have these environments you know, if you need a second or two to do something, but children shouldn't be spending long periods of time in that kind of enclosed environment because we want them to move as much as possible. So, yeah, I, I think anything that stops movement, we would definitely not recommend. Um, and, you know, just to, to answer this question generally, um, there, there are some things personally I'm not, I'm not even speaking on behalf of Domain International now. I'm just speaking about myself, that there are some things I'm concerned about with child development. For example, I'm concerned about drinking from plastic water bottles. Uh, you know, a lot of, of plastic water bottles have chemicals in them. 
uh, and the water inside of, of plastic bottles, um, you know, like the plastic is made with something called bisphenol A or BPA, and there are concerns that uh, that that chemical um, is is not good for for brain development. And I'm I'm also you know. I, I just have to say these things because if a parent asks me, I have to give my honest answer. I'm concerned about pregnant mothers drinking from plastic water bottles. I'm concerned. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I would. I, I used really, to avoid them actually, but uh, yeah. somebody told me that uh, water does not absorb anything, but just you know, if you have uh, fish in a tin and. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't agree with that, um, and yeah, th but the, what they were saying is true that. Uh, cans often have um, a BPA, um, but I think especially pregnant mothers need to be careful. Uh, by the way, there's research now showing that sunscreen, if you're putting on sunscreen, the chemicals in the sunscreen do get into our blood. And if you are breastfeeding, they will find the chemicals from the sunscreen in your breast milk. So, you know, you know, so there, there, there are all kinds of things that I am concerned about. Now, I, I do want to say that if you were a pregnant mother and you drank from a plastic water bottle, it doesn't mean that your child is somehow harmed forever. But I, I think that when we look at the population as a whole, there are some children and some mothers that maybe because of their own physiology, they might be more sensitive to certain factors than others. Um, so yes, I, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about pesticide use. Um, so there, there are unfortunately many things that I'm concerned about. So, but I, you know, I just recommend to be as careful a, as possible. But what about natural sunscreens? Are they okay? Because I use only natural cosmetics. Yeah, yeah. So definitely natural sunscreens are much, much better. My wife and I use a, a natural sunscreen. Unfortunately, I don't know the name because she. she it makes you white, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think she buys from a, a company called Green Goddess. I think that uh, I think that's what it's called. It has natural sunscreens. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sure. a long question, uh, uh, but I think you've answered the fir first part. Can we make single word book? Yes, of course, I introduce new vocabulary in the form of books with single words and uh, free two word sentences and a picture of every, sen uh, every uh, sentence. It's okay, you've already said about it. I think this mom jo joins yeah. uh, uh, later. Could you please give us more examples of opportunity solving games for reading? Well, I, I answered. I'm not a creative person. I, I answered that one. That was when you were, you were out. Yeah, ah, okay, okay, ah, okay. Yeah, all of it. I did, yeah. Yeah, all of it. Okay, the end. So there are just, uh, it's my free guess, but I think you still want it. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, my son does not like, even recently, hate balance activities Activity. proposed by Doman. He was accepting them in the previous months. However, uh, it's going worse and worse. He's 12 months old, and I wonder why it happened. Yeah, and I'm not sure why he stopped liking them. It could be many reasons. Maybe there, he got scared during one session. Um, you know, one important thing that everyone needs to remember in the, in the book, Fit Baby, Smart Baby, Your Baby, it talks about the importance of a neck collar for babies when doing those activities because you don't want your child's neck flying around. So first of all, just make sure um, that if you're doing balance activities with an infant, that you're using the neck collar. Um, but I, look, I don't know why your son stopped enjoying it. Maybe he just doesn't like the, the feeling right now of being held. So honestly, if, he, if he's having that strong reaction against it, I would stop it for a few weeks. And I wouldn't even talk about it with him. Uh, if there are other children in the household, brothers or sisters, or cousins or friends that come around, do the activities with the other kids and let him watch it. Many children, when they don't wanna do something, when they see other children doing it, then they wanna do it themselves. So I would recommend stopping, do it with a few other kids and then he'll probably want to do it again. 
Okay, thank you. And I just remember I have one more question because I, I forgotten to write it down from Instagram. Uh, one mom asks if it's pro uh, possible to prevent travel sickness because she uh, suffers from it and she wants uh, to do something so that her baby doesn't uh, uh, suffer from it. But I think it's related to, the, to these balance activities because my, my daughter doesn't have it and I, I have no. Trouble. No, and it, forward it, roll is terrible for me. No, yeah, no, no. These these balance activities are essential for yeah, yeah. Like there's there's no kid who grew up on balance activities that I know who has car sickness, for example. Um, you know, I, I had a recent experience where I was in a uh, elevator, and many people when elevators are going down quickly, they have this like very weird sensation. And it, they, it kind of like throws their balance off. And so it happened and everyone in the elevator went, uh, and I was like, what, what's, what's going on? You know? So I, I think the balance activities eliminate those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, uh, you, uh, oh, there's something more you mentioned the issues with BPA and pregnant women. Do you have any other recommendations for expectant moms? Oh, <laughs> so for me too. I mean, um, I look, I come from a perspective of I work with children every day who have had brain damage and, and have affected development. And what I can say to you, having seen thousands and thousands of cases, is that every step we take away from the natural course of pregnancy and delivery of a baby every step increases the likelihood of some kind of developmental issue. So if you ask me, what would you recommend, you know, um, you know a natural delivery or a C-section? Definitely, you know, a natural delivery. Do I recommend um, if, you know, sometimes it's very common now in the United States, I don't know about Poland, where doctors will schedule births. You know, they'll say, you know, because for doctors, they want to schedule, you know, um, you know they, they'll say to moms, you know, if your due date is this day, if you don't give birth within a week or two after that date, I'm gonna bring you in, we will induce the, the delivery and you, you can deliver. No. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's similar. Yeah. Uh, why, why would we do that? Like, why would we think that we, uh, using medication can determine the right time for a child to be born? Um, I, I think that that's very unwise. So everything from what a pregnant mom is eating, drinking from the delivery itself, I would recommend to, to be as natural as possible. Now, all of these things, C-sections save lives every day. So I'm not saying that a cesarean section is not necessary. I'm just saying we shouldn't do it out of choice. That's really an emergency option that, that should be used. So um, yeah, that, that's my general advice. Do things as naturally as possible. Watch, watch out for chemicals. Um, eat as healthy as possible. Um, but what if mom can't eat? Because, you know, <laughs> for the last two weeks, I, I just force myself to eat just, you know, anything. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, um, nausea during pregnancy is often a good sign. So don't, don't be so worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> just try to find the food that, will, that, that you can eat. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for staying more than 90 minutes. <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. And I saw one comment about mineral sunscreens are safe, but not nano. Thank you for that information. I, you know, I need to look into it myself. Um, Melissa, yeah, I, th I think she's right. Because what, I, 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 my, my wife came into the room, so I'm going to ask her, what's the sunscreen that you use? Green goddess. Green goddess. So I was correct about the, the brand. So maybe you can ask her about this baby sling. You have a specific like sling or carrier that you recommend Whoa. for parents. The problem is, is that the one that we used to recommend, they don't make it anymore. Yeah, the ones that the one we used to rec recommend, they don't make anymore. Do you? Is there is there a specific design that you recommend? The, the more important thing is that 
Um, yeah, my wife here. She's coming. Hello. Everyone. Oh, hello, hello. This is <laughs> Melissa. Hi. <laughs> so, when it comes to a, so this is for babies. Yeah, babies. Yeah, for babies, like baby sling or ring sling. Uh, like it's like a huge scarf. Yeah. So there's. Is, there's it, is it okay to carry a baby in this or not really? Well, look, there's lots of different models. The more important thing is that um, you find something where essentially you can put baby on your hip and keep their back nice and straight. It's actually better for you to hold them on your side. Um, this is good for, for hip development. It's good for the back as well. Um, and I don't know if you have any parents with kids with special needs, but if they're young enough and need to be carried, you want something like that as well um, if there's a specific brand I we don't we haven't really found one yet that we're happy with but um, I know that there are like different long wraps and you can use it in different ways so even if there's something like that that can be modified so the baby's on the side with the back nice and straight that's really the, the best thing yeah, I have something like this, a long rectangular scarf and so I can, yeah, but so front position or on my back is not okay. Yeah, we, I mean, we try and avoid it just because it's, it's not a great position for the baby or their hips because this is a lot more narrow than this. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Um, so, yeah, so sitting on the front is, is not always the best thing. And then, also, if they're on the side, it's better for the neck support as well, where front or back, you really don't have as much control. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I have to, because I'm pregnant, <laughs> I'm expecting a new baby and I have to learn because it was really difficult for me to learn uh, to, to put the baby on my back because, you know, you, you need to tie it in a special way. And mm -hmm. on the, nobody taught me the hip position, <laughs> but I think it's possible with this scarf. Yeah, yeah, some of them it is, but there are, I mean, if you go online and look up carriers, I've seen them where they, they sit on the hip, um, but it's, it's not always so easy to find. Mm -hmm. Ah, so they are ready-made and you, you don't have to tie, tie them? And, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there mm -hmm. are, they do exist. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so, <laughs> this was not my question, <laughs> actually, but other moms of the... Yeah, but, but thank, thank you very much. <laughs> and I guess this is the last one. <laughs> yeah. Raspberry seed oil is also great as a sunscreen. Oh, that's uh, interesting. I learned something new every day. Yeah, <laughs> something new. Yeah, I have to test it. Because <laughs> I use those mineral filters, but you know, they make you white. And, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> look a bit strange, but <laughs> it's better than chemicals. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> sure, my pleasure. I, I hope that this session has been helpful to everyone and, uh, and I look forward to doing them again in the future. Yeah, me, me, me too. And I hope uh, you've managed to record it. <laughs> yes, I, I think I have. I think I have, so. <laughs> yeah, because if you managed to record it, I can, I can uh, post it and share it and then, um, uh, well, um, uh, start tr translating it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I, I okay. hope that after maybe two or three weeks, I will feel better and uh, will be able to do it because with the other webinars, I, you know, uh, I'm a working mom. Uh, so I, I just didn't have time for that, and and um, the webinar with, with Jordan was translated by by one dad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I haven't published it yet because uh, somebody else needs to add subtitles and so on. But uh, sure. it, it'll take time, but uh, there will be a Polish version. Sure. Okay, sounds good. All <laughs> right, thanks so much for having and me. I survived. <laughs> yes, you did. Great. <laughs> okay. All right, it's been a pleasure, everyone. Bye-bye. It's a pleasure for me too. Bye-bye. Thank you very much again. Sure.